Hello and welcome back to the express videos relevant for ACCA paper P2. Remember to download our express notes at www.dxpgroup.com in order to um, uh, follow easily this uh, video. This video will focus on preparation of a statement of cash flow from the group perspective. Having said that, remember not to feature in this statement any intra-group cash flows. Group cash flow statement is a lot more easier to prepare in the exam than a consolidated statement of financial position or a consolidated statement of comprehensive income. Why I'm saying that is because the um, consolidation adjustments, most of them are non-cash, like an allowance for unrealized profit or elimination of intra-group balances or adjustments um, to the fair value of the net assets at the date of acquisition. Group cash flow statements, one in every five sittings is actually tested as part of question one in the um, exam, is highly unlikely to appear in part B of the exam. In order to be able to produce a group statement of cash flows, um, individual cash flow statement preparation at the level of F7, it's a prerequisite knowledge. So feel free to download the express video relating to that from our website. Just a quick reminder um, of how basically we are producing individual cash flow statements in an indirect method, which is more likely to appear in the exam. We start with profit before tax. We eliminate any non-cash transactions which are reported in the income statement. We go down to the level of operating cash flows and we adjust for working capital changes in inventory, receivables and payables. We feature tax paid and interest paid and that would be cash generated from operations. And then we'll present uh, cash flows which are generated or used in investing or financing activities. In a group cash flow statement, you need to be aware of three extra things. The group will acquire or sell subsidiary part way into the accounting period. Cash will be paid to non-controlling interest. Cash might be received from investment in associates and disclosures on the acquisition and disposal of subsidiary, which these are fairly simple. Key workings and method. Remember the reconciliation of profit before tax down to cash from operations, where we basically said we start at the profit before tax, but this one will be at the group level. And what we need to adjust is everything that is non-cash and was already reported in earnings before tax. That would be items like amortization and depreciation. That would be impairment of the goodwill in the current year. That may be a write down of inventory to recoverable value, increase in tax payables or any other type of provision like warranty costs. That may be goods which were purchased on credit leading to an increase in payable or sales made on credit leading to an increase in receivables. So basically so far the only addition that we have brought in at group level is the impairment of goodwill in the year. Whenever we buy a subsidiary or actually sell a subsidiary during the accounting period be aware to take into consideration on a line-by-line -line basis the increase if we acquire a subsidiary or decrease in the net assets of the business. What I mean by that, so for instance, if I'm trying to work out the changes in trade receivables, okay, those increase in trade receivables, part of it may be due to the purchase of a subsidiary. The same thing will appear with payables, accrual and provisions or receivables and prepayment due to purchase of subsidiary. This will never affect the profit before tax consolidated by the subsidiary because those are pre-acquisition and therefore will not have any effect on the operating cash flow and it should be disregarded in the above reconciliation that we just talked about.
On the other hand, when we are looking at the working capital adjustment, make sure you take into consideration that a subsidiary is acquired on a line-by-line -line basis from the date of acquisition until the time of disposal. What I mean by that is when you are comparing the opening and closing balance for, let's say, receivables, you need to take into consideration the receivables that actually are consolidated at the year end in the statement of financial position, which were bought, which were bought by um, an acquisition of a subsidiary, not via a cash transaction. So let's have a numerical example to illustrate what I just said. Edgar Company purchased a subsidiary, Edmonco, on 30th of September 2001. On that date, Edmond Company had receivables in the statement of financial position of 1200. At date of acquisition, 1200. Edgar Company and its subsidiary, at the start of the year, they have receivable of 9800 and at the end of the year of 11450. So, when we are calculating the change in um, working capital relating to increase in receivables, okay, we will do exactly the same thing. Year-end value less opening balance, but make sure you deduct the 1200 which is actually an increase in the year-end receivables due to the acquisition of the subsidiary, not as a cash movement. Q workings that you need to be familiar with at the group level will relate to associates and non-controlling interest. As I previously said, the group might receive cash from the associate if they decide to distribute some dividend or some dividends are actually distributed by the subsidiary to non-controlling interest. And we have to reflect this. We will use exactly the same technique by opening the T-account as we have used uh, for the preparation of individual cash flow statements. So for an associate, we will open a T-account where we'll include the opening and closing balance as per the statement of financial position. We will include our share of profit from the associate. And what we will do is balance of the account coming back with the cash received from the associate as a balancing item. The same thing we'll do with non-controlling interest. We will have an opening and closing balance. We will increase the value of non-controlling interest with their share of the profit of the subsidiary and their share of other comprehensive income from the subsidiary. And when balancing off the account, the missing item will be the cash paid to non-controlling interest as dividends. The same scenario is basically should apply when we are actually calculating any other type of figure that we need in the cash flow statement. Like for instance, when we are looking for the figure um, on acquisitions of property, plant and equipment, we will start again with the opening and closing balance. We will charge depreciation, any impairment losses and disposals at net book value. We will increase it with the value of finance lease signed during the accounting period. We will increase it with the value of uh, property, plant and equipment acquired via a new subsidiary and the revaluation reserve and the cash paid to acquire property, plant and equipment will actually be discovered as a balancing item. What I want you to be aware of at group level, whenever the parent is buying or selling a subsidiary, the only cash movement will be reflected in the investing activity. So if I'm buying a subsidiary, I will have a cash outflow, meaning how much the parent has paid, less the cash of the subsidiary, which is immediately consolidated. The same thing you need to be aware of when you're reflected the cash coming in from a sale of a subsidiary. Some cash is coming in, but immediately after, the cash of the subsidiary gets deconsolidated from the consolidated statement of financial position, and therefore only the net flow will be presented as cash coming from a sale of subsidiary in group statement of cash flows.